bed, but if we run into problems, I will have to dug out, duck out. Okay. We will ask you to say that you're present. Great. Pretty soon, actually. Yep. Yeah. Bedtime isn't for another hour and a half or so, so. Okay, Ms. from Marshall Amherst Media has let us know that they're good to go. You are the co-host of this meeting. Uh, we are recording. It is 6.50. You do have a quorum of the board. I think you're good to go. All right. Thanks, Pam. You're welcome. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of October 16th, 2024. My name is Doug Marshall and as chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.50 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by chapter two of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda where the Zoom link is listed at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of, of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so, <clears throat> let's see. In the event we are unable to provide meeting access due to economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of the meeting on the town website as soon as feasibly possible. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively and return to mute. Bruce Coldham. I am here. Lawrence Klutz. I'm here. Jesse Major. Present. Fred Hartwell. I am present. Johanna Newman. Present. Karen Winter. Present. And I, Doug Marshall, am present. Thank you all. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment, and I will call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to re-mute yourself. To the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be taken at other times when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, time is 6.53. We have all board members present and we'll start with minutes. Uh, we have one set of minutes, the minutes from August 21st uh, available for our approval and any edits that people wanna suggest. Um, does anyone have any suggested edits or other comments on these minutes? Okay, Bruce. Um, I wasn't sure if, uh, if folks can advise here, but I'm quoted at the bottom of page two, or I'm referenced at the bottom of page two as citing that 70 dB is quiet. And what I meant to say, it's quiet for a bar um and uh do we think we need to be specific about that because we're talking about a bar but uh 
because 70 dB is not quiet. It's just quiet in the contents of a bar. So, yeah, I think it would make more sense if we added the for a bar. Yeah. Anyway, that's that was the only comment that I had. And apart from that, I would move acceptance of the minutes. Uh, okay. With the, uh, I'll second that motion um, with the edit that you made. Mm -hmm. Got it. Sorry, Jesse, I just went ahead and did it. Um, <laughs> anybody else have any other comments? I'm not seeing any. All right, why don't we just go through and uh, get the minutes approved out of the way. Start with you, Bruce. Aye. And Fred? Aye. Jesse? Aye. Johanna? Aye. Karen? Aye. Lawrence? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. So that's seven in favor, no, no abstentions, and no nays. Motion passes. All right, moving along. Item number two, time is 6.55, and time now for public comment. Uh, let me change my view here. I see 14 attendees. Uh, of the public. Uh, I usually read their names as I can see them, and I will do so now. I see Aiden Lee, Aiden Sabina, Barry Roberts, Dean Gendron, Gail Flood, Gail Flood again, Justin Smith, Ken Rosenthal, Maggie Smith, Mara Keene, Melanie St. John, Mike Thomas, Sarah Barr, and Tom Reedy. All right, I know a number of those people are here for our hearing later. Are there any members of the public who would like to make a public comment about something not on tonight's agenda at this time? Okay, I am not seeing any hands from any members of the public. I guess I will conclude that there are none this evening. Last call for public comment. Okay. Um, Pam, um, we've mm -hmm. advertised the public hearing to start at 7.05. That is correct. So, so, you... we, so if I start, if we start now, we'd be a few minutes in advance of the advertisement. Yes. So, All right. so in that case, uh, why don't we skip down to another part of the agenda? We can see if we can go through some of our standard boilerplate here for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, I see Nate Malloy has joined us. And um, as far as you know, Pam, are, is there any old business not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance? No. How about new business? No. Are there any upcoming Form A and R subdivision applications that you might want to give us a preview of? We do have one of those. No and no. So if you bear with me, I believe I put this in your packet. Okay, so this A&R is, whoops, what happened here? 
is for property um, known as 40 Valley, it's Valley View Lane, I believe, um, right here, Valley Lane. And then this is Berkshire Terrace. So what is happening is the owner of Valley Lane is purchasing this very small piece of property right here from his neighbor on Berkshire Terrace. Am I right, Nate, or am I saying that backwards? No. Yes, this is going away. Yeah. This right here is going away. And is being added to Berkshire Terrace. So let me show you the other. Um, I believe there was a survey drawing too. Yeah, there yeah, is. And that showed it more clearly. So I'm not going to, whoops. Oh no, hold on, bear with me. I could share it quickly. Okay, Nate, if you can, that's great. There it is. Yeah, so it's the little rectangle. It's Correct. Just a little area. So it's like, uh, you know, 40 by 10 feet is being added to the, pro or, you know, added or removed, however you want to say it, from a property. Uh -huh. And is that a uh, paper street that's running up and down on the page? It's a sewer easement. Okay. And All we right. have so, so both properties have frontage. Um, I presume whatever maybe it's irrelevant whether there's the adequate size circle for the house, since there's already a house, right? At least on one of the properties. Right. So uh, approval is not required under the subdivision uh, bylaw. And the question for the board is whether anybody objects to my signing this the statement that uh, approval is not required on behalf of the board. Bruce, I see your hand. Uh, I don't think I do, Doug, but I'm curious as to, I mean, I think we could all learn something by knowing why such a an intricate uh, and small adjustment is being made in the property. Is this to give a few extra square feet so it becomes a duplexable property or is what's the purpose? Uh, that's probably it. That's probably it. Okay. But you don't know necessarily. I mean, I, I think that could be it, but uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Okay. I mean, well, that's, that's yeah, the I idea. Mean, it's an, it's an odd, uh, shape anyways for the property at some point it seems like property lines were yeah. rearranged in the past and so now they're you know they're being changed again well it's also a little odd that they're not squaring the whole right. boundary off right yeah they're tracking the uh easement along do we know who the easement's in favor of you mean the sewer easement yeah uh, I'm, I'll look on the online. I was pretty sure it's for the town. Okay. I suppose that would be true if it's not otherwise stated. I know we have an easement, the sewer easement going across our part parcels, the uh, co-housing parcels, and that's uh, favored. Uh, that's uh, that. That's for WG Coles. Right. All right. You all set, Bruce? Yes. Thank you. All right. Fred? Uh, yeah, this is... Uh, it's going to change the property size to an easy, even 26,000, which I think qualifies it for uh, a, an additional occupancy. Yeah, an additional unit. Yeah. So that's pretty clear that's what's going to happen. And I don't see any reason for it not to happen. But anyway. Right. I mean, if you look at the neighborhood, the lots are really small. Uh, so it's not. You know, if there are another unit here, it's actually just in keeping with the pattern of the neighborhood. Yeah, but that's not really the question in front of us. <laughs> no, it's, you know, is this transfer of 391 square feet 
you know, can that be allowed through the ANR process? Right. And I presume, uh, Nate, that you you and your staff think that the answer is yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, um, so Pam, you did not have this on the agenda. Uh, you brought this up as an upcoming, or or were, were you expecting us to vote on this this evening? Well, okay. I am expecting you to take a vote on it this evening. I will say, however, that I haven't heard from the town engineer, which to me is unusual. He usually turns these right around for me, um, and I haven't heard from him. So if you do um, decide that you are going to go ahead and um, allow the chair to endorse this plan, you you might want to add the caveat you, based on comment from the town engineer. Or that you're all okay with me not do, signing, but after we hear from the town engineer, mm -hmm. <laughs> he doesn't have any objections. I mean, only have recollection that we don't do actual formal votes on this. It's usually right. more of a consensus conversation. Right. Like, does anybody object? Uh, and if nobody really raises an objection, we just move on. So uh, I guess in that case, I'll just ask formally now, does anybody object to my doing, to, to my signing this on behalf of the board? Uh, approval not required, but not until we hear from the town engineer that he has no objections. Uh, and obviously, if he has some objections, we'll probably bring it back. Mm -hmm. uh, Nate. Yeah, this was filed, though, at the end of September. So we, we only have, a, you know, a limited number of time to act unless we ask, you know, the applicant to extend it. So, you know, we only have, you know, essentially this the rest of this week uh, to act, I think, you know, business days, you know, because then it's the weekend. So. All right, so you think we need to act even if we haven't heard from the town engineer? Well, or it's just, you know, it's uh, constructively granted. And so. Yeah. Okay, does anybody object to me just approving it? 21 days. Right, so. It's... Okay, all right, I'm not hearing any objection. Fred. You are muted. I'm not objecting, but um, I would appreciate it, Nate, if you could talk to the town engineer and explain that there was some consternation at the level of the planning board because we did not hear a report from him. And uh, maybe we'll hear something at our next meeting. I don't think this should pass Yes, I mean, if it's going to be constructively granted, of course, we're going to not get in the way of that. But I want the, the town engineer to know that the lack of any communication from him was duly noted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can do that. I mean, I'm looking online right now and, you know, the, you know, there is the sewer easement. It looks like there's a manhole on the property. And so, you know, whether or not any development happens, they have to, you know, stay clear of that easement. And I don't, I'm, I can't see that there's any other issues with that property in terms of, you know, town utilities. Sometimes, you know, it might be that they're researching what's there, but I, I think it's pretty well documented in that neighborhood. So I can relay, relay those thoughts. All right. Thank you, board members. Uh, and, um... mm. Pam, I guess you and I need to make a, a, an appointment to get together for me to sign. We do. All right. Okay, we've successfully filled our, uh, our time to get us past 7.05. Time now is 7.08. So we'll come back to the public hearing that is advertised for tonight. Let's see. 
Okay, in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2025-05, South, South Pleasant Street, LLC, 4555 South Pleasant Street, Request site plan review approval under section 3.325 of the zoning bylaw to amend previously approved SPR 2024-05, including modifying the site plan and building plan for adjustments to the electrical meters and transformer and modify conditions number 2, 17, 19, 21A, 21B, and 25 and accept modified management plan. Parcel uh, on map 14A-250 two and 281 in the BG and TCDR and MPD zoning district. All right, uh, any board member disclosures about this project? And I see one hand, Lawrence. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. I, uh, as an um, employee of Amherst College, I've been advised to recuse myself from this discussion, so I'm going to turn my camera off and mute myself. Thank you. Any other board member disclosures? Okay. Uh, it looks like we have Tom Reedy and Barry Roberts here with us tonight. Welcome, both of you. And um, go ahead. Um, with your presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members of the board. For the record, Tom Reedy, uh, Turner with Bacon Wilson here in Amherst here on behalf of South Pleasant Street LLC and its application for modification of the site plan or approval, which was granted back in April, I think April 10th of this year. Uh, and with me this evening is landowner Barry Roberts. And so, you know, hopefully this is Quick and simple, we've got really three different aspects of that site plan approval that we're asking for modification on. The first one is exterior changes. The next one is just acceptance of the management plan as revised and frankly is further revised later this late this afternoon. And then the last one is a modification to several of those conditions that the chairman read uh, of the decision itself. And so I'll go through in that order. Um, I don't know that I need to uh, give everybody context of where this site is. I will say it. I won't show it on the map. If you'd like to see it on the map, by all means, please stop and, and let me know. Uh, this is the old Hastings building. Um, um, Tom, 45. Uh, yes. we don't see your screen yet. Yeah, no, I wasn't going to show it. Okay. If somebody wants to see it, I just you know, most folks here know the site that we're talking about. So I was just going to yes, verbally reference it. Very well. Uh, save everybody some time. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the exterior revisions. I think what I'll start with is the transformer relocation, bicycle rack relocation, and the vestibule elimination. And so that's what you should see on your screen right now. So this is what is proposed. I do have the the original. Uh, if anybody wants to see it, it was provided as part of your packet. I think, um, you know, most notably, we'll look down if you can see my mouse in this bottom left corner. The transformer was tucked over a bit more, um, and the bicycle racks kind of were flip flopped with the transformer. Uh, Barry met on site with the folks from Eversource and they requested that the transformer be relocated as shown here. Uh, we've relocated the bicycle racks to the other side, taking up the space that the transformer was in. And previously there was a vestibule, which was a bump out here. Um, but, and Barry can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think each of the, because this, uh, there's a door on the side here, as you can see in this top corner, uh, it needs access, I believe, to the exterior and not to a vestibule. Uh, so that vestibule is a little bump out, was eliminated. Um, one of the other things that was changed, there was a, a 
Hastings with a date under it previously, and now it's just proposed to say Hastings Building uh, up at the top. I've got a uh, landscape plan down here. We've kept the same style. I, you know, I I prefer to look at this one. We've kept all the same plantings here, and instead of surrounding the transformer with these larger plants, which Eversource frowned upon, uh, we have some lower plants that are uh, proposed for that easterly side of the transformer. So that's, I'd say like the, the first group of exterior changes. I'm happy to sit on this one or I can go to the electrical meters if you want. Um, well, I see one hand of questions. So why don't we talk about these for a few minutes? Jesse? Thanks. Yeah, just quick question, Tom. So, so the bigger plantings that were removed is there a reason the big ones can't stay on the street side and have lower ones on the, uh, I guess it's west side, just to block visibility a little from the street? Yeah, and Barry, maybe you can answer this one because you met on site. I don't know if there's something special about access on this side of the transformer as compared with this side of the transformer. You know, yes, that's where Eversource is going to have the doors that access the transformer, so they need it clear. And that's a fixed, I mean, there's a there's a reason the doors are on that side and not another side? Yeah, okay. I believe so. That's what they requested. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> hey, Tom, just quickly, how the one, the, so the lower plants, uh, the what, what are they? Um, and like, what's the height they would get to? Yeah, those look like, uh, Pennsylvania sedge, and I've got to be honest, uh, I don't know, let's see, oh, there we are, six to 12 inches tall, so about a, a foot tall, and the ones on the other side are inkberry hollies, and those will get two to three feet tall. So it's basically a grass. Correct. That, you know. Well, I guess, I mean, I kind of share Jesse's comment, but I do see that the entire transformer area is somewhat shielded by the planting that's farther out toward the street. Yeah, I mean, if there's a reason the doors need to be on that side, fine. If they could be on the south or west side, that would make more sense to me and get more coverage of the transformer, but again, not, not a huge deal. Thank you. Okay. Johanna? Uh, you're muted. My comment is along the same line of questioning, which is, it's, I don't know, like I'm I'm sitting here being like, how is it possible that these transformers of which there must be, you know, thousands, if not millions around the country only allow the door to be on one side? And my question is, how was there any kind of, pushback on Eversource's request of like, actually, we, you know, this is like in the heart of downtown and we'd really love to screen this equipment if possible. So, you know, is there another option or is this the only option? All right, so, Yohana, uh, actually, Tom, I don't, do you want to answer that? I see Fred's got his hand up and I know he's got some electrical background. We'll go with Fred first. Okay, Fred. Well, I uh, I don't want to speak for Eversource, but they're going to be coming in from the the street line, uh, so the uh, the feeders to that the medium voltage feeders to that transformer are going to run uh, uh, east to west from the street, and um, I suspect. Uh, Eversource wants to uh, be able to set up their pulling equipment and, and be, have the access without dealing with potential uh, vehicular traffic. Uh, so I suspect that's why that would be their preference, but I, I, I don't want to speak for them. Okay, thanks, Fred. Tom, uh, what were you going to say? Yeah, so, something similar about the orientation of the transformer you know, if you look at it, look at the other plan, it was tucked away 
uh, further on this side. And I think just like Fred said, you know, it's, uh, I think it's somewhat rectangular. This may show it as a bit more of a square, but I think it's a little bit more rectangular than this. And so my suspicion is you either have doors on this side or this side, or you would have to totally flip it. And then I think we're dealing with um, probably access issues. So I think just to buttress what Fred said, I think that's why it's on the most open side. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. I don't see any more hands at the moment. Um, uh, Tom, regarding the vestibule that was eliminated, um, I presume there's now a vestibule inside the building since there usually has to be a vestibule at a main entrance for that. Yeah, I don't think that's changed on the interior of the building. And maybe what I can do is let me stop my share and bring up the original uh, approved plan. And I can't remember whether the uh, the the former vestibule only went one story or did it have a m more prominent massing on the building? No, it was it was only one story. And I will share my screen again so you can. So if you're following my mouse, it's it's just this small area right here. Um, I'm, Those... I'm, that's not making sense to me. I'm seeing your mouse on the walkway. We're still seeing the, the previous uh, plan. Oh, was... are you? Look at that. Oh, well, maybe I'll show you. So this is where in the next uh, image, you'll see something lacking. So if you... Okay. Follow that and then let me stop being a bozo and put this up. Okay. So if you can see the original approval. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in this area right here, this is where that vestibule existed. Yeah. Can you scroll up to the rendering? Uh, the other way. This way here? Right there, yeah. Okay, yes. This power continues to exist. So maybe this is the best image for you here, Doug? Yeah, so that that's the vestibule that went away. Correct, that you can see right here behind that, behind those plantings. Uh -huh. So this remains, this um, hovering remains, and it's this little vestibule that we no longer have. But but what you see here vertically with the red, that continues to exist. Okay. Um, Jesse. Thanks. Uh, sorry, now I've got to ask again, looking at the original, go backward a little bit. Is there a reason then the bike racks had to flip rather than just making the plantings on the east side lower to allow the access? Because if it stayed where it was, then the bikes would also help screen a little bit. Like, it actually yeah, sh it shifted. Yeah, so it's a favor, but this is something that's really needed. What I'm trying it, to add. Yeah, so it, it shifted away from the building. And I'll, I'll call on Barry in a second because he met with Ryan from Eversource on site. And this is where they, well, not this one, but the, the one that you actually are seeing, that is where they asked for the, the sighting of the transformer. And so it wasn't just as simple as reducing the plantings to allow access. I'll go back, you know, so if you kind of screenshot that visual in your head, and I'm sorry, I don't have a, a side by side, you know, understanding yeah, that right. in the next, yeah. right? In the next image, this won't be there. This line is going to be kind of your, your demarcation point, if you will. So I'll stop this share and I'll go to the previous share. So again, here's that same demarcation line that we, I showed you, this is where that vestibule was. Right, yeah, I see it moving over. Again, I'm just okay. trying to figure out, is this like just making it easier for them or is this something they really need to happen? I don't know how often you've dealt with Eversource, but if- Oh, I, have, I haven't, so I appreciate that. Yeah, 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 but, yeah. But you yeah. understand, and, and again, I'll leave it alone after this. I appreciate your effort to screen. No, it. and I and I get what and trust me, if we, you know, from an aesthetics point of view, if if 
we could have screened it better, we we would have, right? Like the, the original plan is what we would have loved to have. This is just as a function of listening to the utility company and um, they are really the ones who are directing, frankly, even to get enough energy for this site was kind of a Herculean task. We can get into that, but I, I won't bore you with it. Okay, thanks, Jesse. Karen? Is there a way that you could put up one of those little screened nice fences and have uh, climbing flowers? Or I mean, there might be other things that one can do. I'm not going to push it, but um, to screen a box like that, there must be some uh, things that you could do that Eversource would agree with because they're not going to take up that much space. We can certainly inquire. Um, I think if you were to look around town, you know, even to, to my thoughts right now, I don't know of others that have real screening. Uh, if anything, the transformers themselves are, I'll we'll make a verb out of this, muralized, if you will. Um, and so I, I would suspect that if there was the opportunity to screen these transformers, they'd all, I would expect that the town would have asked this before, or they'd all be screened. And that's just not the case. So I, I think that's what we're dealing with here. Well, there, there's no doubt that if anything was put in front of the east side, it would need to be removable so that the doors could be opened and the access could happen to the transformer. So something that's growing on a fence would have to get ripped out. Okay, anything else, Karen? No, sorry. Okay, Bruce. Um, I don't share everybody's concern so much about this, uh, partly from what Tom says, that we've become accustomed to these things uh, being around. Uh, one of the solution is to paint uh, uh, murals on them, which seems to be allowed. And I would say that's probably the solution if we, if we really uh, are troubled by this. But I just wanted to remind us all that, and this is uh, evident from the view uh, given in the top right-hand corner here, uh, th this uh, transformer is pushed fairly way down from the street in, uh, in, a, in a kind of a somewhat down or at the end of a canyon. So I, I think it is largely screened. Uh, it's not screened so much from somebody who's um, taking the accessibility route or walking down this uh, alleyway. But for the bulk of uh, the uh, the world of Amherst, it seems to me to be satisfactorily screened, uh, although it would be virtually hidden if it had been done the way it was originally suggested. So I don't think we've lost very much because it's, it, because it's located um, down this little alleyway quite a ways. Uh, that's a, a view. I don't know whether it's a compelling one, but it, it's enough for me to be less concerned about this. All right. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Tom, uh, why did you decide not to put the date on the Hastings building sign? It was, I think, something that um, uh, Mary Broll uh, decided. I mean, so I think it's an homage to her late husband's family, and I think they were most comfortable with it appearing as it's shown here. And so out of respect, I and I don't want to speak for Barry, but my presumption is that out of respect, Barry acquiesced to the request. Okay. All right. Um, I'm not seeing any hands at the moment. Why don't you go to the second group of your requests this evening? Do we want to do you want to see the electric meters? Maybe I'll get some momentum for the next group. So uh, here I'll show you what was originally approved because I think based on everybody's comments, what we're doing is probably going in the right direction here. Um, okay, originally approved. So if you're able to see my screen, uh, this is uh, looking from the north. So we're looking southerly. So imagine yourself at Amherst Coffee, um, having a nice iced coffee, maybe looking down that alley. This is what you would 
have seen in the previous iteration, there were 22, uh, potentially even 23 meters on this northerly facade that you'll see in these two areas here. So as a result of Amherst College's tendency for a term of years, we are eliminating that meter bank and we were proposing two meters. And then Eversource said, good, but we don't want them there. We'll show you where we want them. And so where they want them is on the westerly side of the building. So think, I mean, this is this is really tucked back um, that you're probably only going to see if you were to come down those back steps uh, where Amherst Cinema is on your left and you walk down those steps. You know, I'm sorry that it's not colorized, but um, frankly, I don't think that Barry wanted to pay to have it colorized because it's such a minor change. You've got the two electric meters. In, in, and so for context, you're on the westerly side of the building. The the drive aisle is right where my mouse is here. This is a, a double door that's always been proposed. If you could virtually walk around this building, the electric meter bank would be not on the wall that I'm showing, but on the northerly wall, um, which is yeah. right in that area. So, so we've got what, two meters here. This is what we would perceive as the back of the building, assuming the front was on Pleasant Street. Correct. And it faces that slope that's at the back of the current parking lot. That is correct. Or until recently existing parking lot. <laughs> Uh, Fred. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, going to take a leap here and say that this is <clears throat> a function of the what I take to be the elephant in the room here, and that is the function of the occupancies here is changing to become a uh, basically an offshoot of Amherst College, and when that happens, they're all going to be collectively metered as one because the, the college is going to be paying the utility and not individual tenancies. Am, am I surmising that correctly? I think I'll put a little bit of finer point on that, uh, Fred, if I could. It is a function of that. However, there would have been nothing preventing Barry from doing the same thing previously. And so I say that to say, or in the future, because all it would mean then is he uh, individual tenants do not get individual meter bills. Uh, Barry would have to, I'll call it gross rent these units, and then Barry would be responsible to pay for the utility cost for any electric used by any of the tenants in the future. It just now so happens to be that the occupant of the residential portion of this mixed use building is Amherst College and under the lease, they're going to be responsible for this. But you know, part of this to step back is to ensure that in the future when Amherst College's lease is up, Barry's gonna be able to actually rent uh, this, this building because it's still, you know, as, as the chairman noted in the beginning, it's you know, under the mixed use category because it is a mixed use building with the non-residential piece and then the residential piece. So while I, you know, similar to what you did for the ANR, I think your um, assumption is correct. I do want to make that point of it's not exclusive because it's Amherst College, but it has come up because it's Amherst College. Okay. And so uh, whenever Amherst College leaves and Barry goes back to marketing each unit individually, it's possible he'll come back and uh, ask to put 23 meters on the west side of the building. Well, I, if I could, or I the say, north side? Any, anything, well, anything's possible, but Barry, I mean, I think the way the wires are going to be run for this, it would make it, I would suggest cost prohibitive to actually come back to request the separate metering of those units in the future. Okay. Okay, um, not seeing any ha any hands from any of the board. Um, let's go to the third category of 
conversation tonight. So we can take these separately or together, and it's it's really twofold, the acceptance of the revised management plan and additional information under the management plan as most recently updated this afternoon, and the modification of certain conditions uh, for the site plan approval. And okay. so, so would you mind bringing up the management plan and showing us what has changed from the original approved management plan? I and, can do And explaining that. why they need to change. Certainly. I mean, I can probably get Pam to bring it up if you have are having trouble finding it. No, I've I've got it. I just uh, want to make sure that it's the most updated one. Okay. So I'll bring up the first one, and if excuse me, I'll just look at my notes so I can call it exactly what the differences are. Okay. So you should be seeing that revised management plan. The First change, and there's there's three changes on this management plan. The first change you're going to see down here, um, and it's really for I, I call it transparency and, and reputation is probably the, the the best way to categorize all of these. Why we're here before you, right? Because the last time we were here, Barry said this is what the project is, and subsequently that's changed. And both Barry and Amherst College both have, I think, stellar reputations in the community. And they wanted to make sure that there wasn't ever any sense um, that they were trying to not be transparent or not do something above board. And so that's that's really the purpose of all of this, Doug, is that you know, we just want to not not a ton has changed because at the end of the day, Barry's still going to be you know who the town's going to call and who's ultimately responsible uh, for all of these items. It's just that for some of them, like here, residents may utilize various nearby Amherst College surface lots. So that's part of this management plan while Amherst College would be a tenant, which is different than previous. So that's one of them. Uh, first one's the same. Third one's the same. Signage is the same. And then the next two are a bit, a bit different just because, you know, we've again said... Amherst College is the first line of attack as far as it, it really is their responsibility. However, the primary point of contact and who's primarily responsible in case of issues will be the landowner. And that's for both landscaping and snow removal. So those really three points are the changes to the management plan. So if, or let's say when Amherst College stops being the primary tenant, you are prepared to return and give us a new management plan. That is correct. Okay. Um, although I respect your, uh, your effort to maintain your reputation, why bother to do this? I think it's, I think it's just that, right? So, as a, uh, you, you could have just come back and asked for a, you know, a sort of point of just a piece of information to give us rather than submitting new management plans and uh, changing the conditions. I think when we get to the conditions, there's probably going to be a bit more uh, of an appropriate modification. Um, I can appreciate your point for the management plan and the additional information for the management plan. But I think it just okay. comes back to be that simple, just to make sure that nobody, you know, everybody's sensitive to reputation and that six months in the future, there's not a, well, geez, you know, you pull the fast one on us. Right. And, you know, okay. It's as simple as that. Okay. Uh, first, uh, well, actually, Jesse just dropped off. So Fred, did you have something to say before we uh, go on? Yeah, I think uh, there are, an, as I recall, the original management plan, there's a whole lot. I remember going through it in detail and finding a bunch of issues with it, that all of which were in the 
being corrected as a result of uh, the information at the prior hearing. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that uh, that apply to conventional landlord tenant relationships and which do not apply here. And so I think it's entirely appropriate that uh, uh, this uh, revised management plan be be submitted. Okay. Thank you, Fred. And um, Tom, just so that I'm, and maybe everybody else is clear, um, the plan now is for Amherst College to lease all of the residential units in addition to the Amherst College store area. Does that comprise the entire building? It does, yes. So they okay. have the non they have a, a lease for the non-residential portion, which is the bookstore, which meets the non-residential percentage requirement under the bylaw. And then they also have a lease for the residential portion, um, which makes up the balance of the building. Okay. And the, uh, the intention of Amherst College is to have probably a mix of staff, faculty, and students occupy the building or uh, how, or would it be exclusively students or how, what is known about that intention? Yeah, it's, I think it's a good question. And it's primarily students at this point, right? Uh, primarily students. Uh, and I think at least one residential life professional residing uh, on site. Okay, so it wouldn't be used for, I don't know, junior faculty who can't find affordable housing in the area and don't want to drive from coal rain or something. I would say, uh, I don't think that's the intention, but but I'll also say there, you know, and we've had plenty of discussions with the, the building department, planning department about this. It It could be that. Right. There would be no prohibition on it being that because these are all, you know, all 22 units are independent living facilities. They're, they're dwelling units. Right. They have their own kitchen. They have their own bathroom, their own um, you know, cooking facilities, bedrooms. And so if Famers College in the future said we don't want this to be what I've just articulated, they and it's still under their lease, they could change it to be that junior faculty if they wanted to. Um, and so that's, you know, I don't see a prohibition in 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 the law that would require them to keep it to one type of occupant right. under uh, their lease. Okay. All right. Why don't you go on to the conditions? Okay. And I guess one question would be, do you want to see the um, additional information on the management plan or are you satisfied oh, with? If yes, yes, please. Why don't you, why don't okay. we go there next? Okay. Um, again, I'll just can can you blow that up a little bit? I certainly can. Now, let me do this. Is that better? That's better. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll just highlight the changes. The first change is down here at the on-site manager. Um, originally the answer was no, and now it's changed to Amherst College will have residential life staff in the building, consistent consistent with its staffing for campus housing. So that's one of the changes. Uh, the next change is just to call out that the landowner, as far as noise management of tenants, parties, et cetera, the landowner will rem remain the primary point of contact and primarily responsible in case of any issues. The next change is down here uh, in the parking management. 
because they're um, in the in the previous version, obviously Amherst College was not involved. So there was no ability to park on the Amherst College surface parking lots. And so that has been an addition. And then in this last one, it's just um, instead of saying management, we've had resident move in and move outs coordinated by Amherst College. But but really the, the balance of the information is the same. It's just calling out Amherst College as that uh, uh, actor there. And then again, the landowner will remain the primary point of contact and primarily responsible in case of any issues. Okay. So Any is... comments from the board on that document? Nate? <clears throat> yeah, I was going to say that, you know, because in totality, the these every, you know, we call them like three different issues that Tom's addressing, uh, mainly the changing conditions required a, a public hearing. So the original decision had a number of conditions that said if the management plan changed, it would just be reviewed at a public meeting. And so really most of these changes could have been dealt with at a public meeting if the other things didn't happen, right? And so typically we don't get into sometimes who the tenant is, right? Our conditions allow any residential or non-residential use in a mixed use building. And we don't necessarily call out who the management company is in such detail. Uh, you know, sometimes it's the owner or we'll say the management company, but we don't, you know, we don't get it so specific. Uh, and so, you know, typically this would just be reviewed at a public meeting. Uh, similarly, I was going to say that the um, the changes to the site plan are pretty minimal. And so if this if those were the only things occurring, you know, it might be a decision by the building commissioner that they're de minimis and could be handled administratively. Um, Eversource does require a certain separation from the buildings. They are getting uh, pretty particular about screening. And so, if you know, as you're talking, I did my Google Street View around town and there's a number of transformers that have nothing around them. You know, they don't maybe it's just a few bollards. And so you know, the location here is tucked away and there's still some vegetation around it. So, you know, the vestibule is by code. So, you know, perhaps those changes could have been administratively uh, handled. And so really it's the changing conditions that, you know, it's and, and the management plan, but really the conditions that are um, requiring a modification of the previous site plan. So there's, I don't know, maybe five to seven changes in the conditions uh, that Tom will present that, you know, nest, you know, really require a public hearing. Okay, thanks for that. Context, Nate. Tom? Sure, without further ado. Okay. Um, okay, so if you can see my screen, you'll see those conditions with the uh, proposed changes. So first one, condition two, all we're asking for is to, if you do in fact uh, accept the new management plan, just to place that new, uh, the date of approval of the, of the management plan. So the management plan and additional information as presented on October 16th, 2024, so that there is that benchmark. So that's the first piece. The next one um, is a change to eliminate apartments and make it dwelling units. And as an aside, this is probably good in conditions going forward because that's technically what the mixed use bylaw requires or, or dwelling units. And that's why I made that point earlier uh, to the chair about that these are all independent dwelling units. And so the change would be to eliminate apartments, to add dwelling units and any permitted non-residential use occupying at least 30% of the first floor, including without limitation, occupancy by a nonprofit educational institution for nonprofit educational uses, provided the mixed use requirement of dwelling units in combination with non-residential space is maintained. And so again, it, it may seem, and some of these may all seem like overkill, but it's it's part of uh, the process of, again, making sure that, and then there's no sleight of hand here, right? Because I'll, I'll back up and, and just somewhat speak generally. Um, there, there is a nonprofit educational use use category. We are not looking to avail ourselves of that use category. We are looking to maintain this as a mixed use building and particularly, we're looking to maintain it as a mixed use building because uh, in the future, when Amherst College no longer is leasing the property, Barry is going to operate it as a mixed use building. And so it's important on the advice of council to keep it as a mixed use building. So that's kind of where we're starting. Also, um, I think it's important that you know we we name 
that it's going to be a nonprofit educational use within the context of that mixed use building, just to make sure that there's kind of the avoidance of doubt. So again, even though it seems a little belabored and I know it's not typical, um, it's something that you know we as the applicant are asking for. And it's not something necessarily that I would expect the planning board in the future to be imposing as conditions of, let's say, you know, University Drive at Amity, the 422. I don't expect this type of specificity in condition to be placed on something like that. Uh, but as as you know, Mr. Chair, and probably Nate has has seen as well, when you're dealing with conditions like this, if the applicant is asking for a condition like this, um, you know that's okay. If the the board were to look to impose a condition without the applicant saying this is okay, you know there could be an issue. But it's it it's different given the fact that we are affirmatively requesting these changes. So that's on seventeen, um, nineteen. Uh, you know, we have asked to not be part of the residential rental property bylaw. Um, if you want to push back on that now before we go any further, I'm I'm happy to address it or we can go through the rest of them and then you can and push back. So this one really just says because of the occupant, we don't uh, we would prefer not to go to the rental register through the rental registration bylaw. Nate, is that something we can waive? Do we have the authority to do that? Well, we could ac not accept the changes. So the building commissioner, you know, in the rental registration bylaw would say that if it's owned and operated and in an educational district, it's exempt. But, you know, being a mixed use building where it is, it would be subject to rental registration. And so, you know, he would not necessarily recommend this condition. This the changes. And that that's a discussion. We you know I I you know I, I spoke with Tom and I mean we're doing this for all the projects. So Wayfinders is doing an affordable housing project, and we're having them be subject to it. All Amherst Housing Authority uh, properties are, you know. So uh, right now nothing's been exempted unless it's already mentioned in the bylaw, right? So there are exemptions in the bylaw. It doesn't apply to you know things in the educational district or things that are serving a nonprofit educational use, you know, on a campus or for other purposes. So um, if it's in the ED zone, so I don't. You know, it's not an onerous task. It's an online application. Once application, you know, once information is entered, it's auto renewed every year. Um, there's an inspection. It won't happen for the first five years on new construction. It'll happen once within the first ten years, and then after that, it could be maybe once every ten years, uh, depending on how that works out. So, um, you know, we're seeing it as an information gathering tool. So the rental registration, you know, the it was, you know, there's a new bylaw passed uh, that took a long time for town council and staff to work on it. And we see it as a really great information gathering tool. Uh, and then also, you know, it allows for some inspections and it provides the ability if there's issues to have a little bit more enforcement action. And so, um, you know, like I said, this isn't necessarily an exempted uh, use or location for this. All right. So. Tom, how strongly do you feel about this? <laughs> I mean, Nate didn't uh, really didn't really answer my question whether we had the authority to waive it. It sounds like building commissioner would prefer we not. Um, I, I don't know what town council would say. Um, you can, if you want to think about it for a second, Jesse, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to come back to that because what I heard Nate say first was the building commissioner would not accept this modification. So yeah. I was wondering the same thing. Really your question, Doug, can we as a board waive this or not? Yeah. I don't know. I'm say, not, I'm not yeah, sure. I guess Doug, when you say waive it, do you mean as in we accept, accept, this accept the changes or we do not accept the changes? Well if, if sorry. Yeah, Doug, I we, mean I mean th this change uh, exempts the applicant from participation in the in the uh, rental registration program. And I'm not sure we have the authority to do that. So that was going to be my point is that ultimately, if the rental registration requires rental registration, I don't know how, I would. I guess I'd say the inclusion or maybe exclusion of this would matter. From, from our perspective, if you say, 
from the planning board's perspective, we're not going to make it a condition and you could eliminate this condition altogether. And then we're just subject to whatever that rental registration is. And if we are subject to it, we're subject to it. If we're not, then we're not. But it, you know, I could I imagine a scenario where there's a condition of this approval, which says you have to register, but the rental registration bylaw itself says we don't. And then we're we're at a conflict in in then you're saying, yes, you do have to register. So that's right. kind of where we're coming from here is that if you say it is a condition, does that take precedent over if the rental registration says we don't have to? Okay, all right. All right. Um, so how did the original condition read? I guess if I look at your underline here and try to ignore all of that, it said the units at the project shall be registered and permitted in a so in accordance with the re rental registration bylaw loss or sus suspension of a rental permit shall constitute a violation of this condition that's all it said correct so it was shall be registered and that's where i think some of the that's what kind of piqued my interest in this condition And if you say shall be registered or sh if required, shall be registered and permitted, I mean, that's a different story. So then at least if there's a fundamental somewhat change in the law, then we don't, we're not in violation right. of this condition as well. I think right. that's right. okay. All right. Let's think about that. Bruce? Um, I'm in... I, I'm interested in Tom's characterization as, as he reflected on it uh, on your uh, urging Doug to say perhaps the, we could strike this. It seems to me that this falls into some of these categories that I often get a little jones by where we put in conditions that uh, that essentially say you shall comply with well for example with the uh, the um, project that we did last time uh, it was the um, golly, um, on Woodside anyway we got into a discussion about conditioning the uh, uh, whether something was accessible or not um, and uh, when I think we ultimately decided we would let the regulatory the appropriate regulatory authority uh, which was the building commissioner and and the uh, and the AAB um uh, statutes take care of this and we didn't have to get involved i don't think the planning board necessarily or has to get involved in putting into its conditions compliance with regulations that are um otherwise you know uh, that are outside the bylaw um so i imagine that this was uh considered by the the staff a harmless enough uh, condition that we'll just you know do as we often do say you shall do this and you shall do that which probably would happen anyway um uh, but in the in in the in the instance where the applicant thinks that they may be or would want to make application to directly to the jurisdiction of the re re residential rental bylaw um, and let that entity, I suppose, the building commissioner, make a decision. I'm kind of persuaded that we shouldn't get in the way of it, that we should let it uh, sort itself out without our intervention, because I personally don't feel strongly committed to supporting the residential bylaw beyond its, uh, uh, beyond, beyond its ordinary promulgation. So that's the way I'm feeling about this, that it seems like we should... Uh, instead of just deleting it altogether. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Um, I was kind of taken with Tom's mentioning that something, a dependent clause like if required by the bylaw, the project shall register. <laughs> um, but uh, there's a bunch of hands up. Um, Nate, I'm gonna let you go next. Sure, I mean, I think the original condition said, you know, shall be registered and permitted in accordance with the bylaw, right? So if, to me, the, the in accordance with the bylaw is that conditional phrase. So if the bylaw exempts this, or it doesn't need to, because it doesn't, you know, the bylaw, you know, says otherwise, then it's in accordance with the bylaw. It doesn't mean it 
has to register if the bylaw says it's exempt. It means it has to, you know, follow the bylaw if it's required to. And so okay. I think the way it was written allows that, you know, from the building commissioner, it's not necessarily, I mean, we could reword it. So it's maybe a little clearer, but I think, you know, you know, shall be registered in accordance with the bylaw. I mean, we have a number of conditions like that. And so, you know, if it's, if the bylaw has some reason why it doesn't need to be registered, it doesn't need to be, um, you know, okay. maybe it's, it's worded a little strongly, but you know, it, it allows for that. All right. Thanks, Tom. Can you, could you interpret it that way? I think you could interpret it that way. Um, I would just suggest if we do the, the clearer we make it, the better. Um, but I don't, and I guess one of the questions maybe for Nate, given the implementation of the, you know, just going down the rabbit hole a little bit, given the implementation of the residential rental bylaw, if there is some, like, if, so oftentimes by way of a little bit of diversion, I come in front of boards and I say, you know, I'm asking for a variance and they say, you can't do that because it's not allowed. And I say, no, 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 it's precisely allowed under the bylaw because you allow variances. And so sometimes people say, well, but it's not allowed. So here I would just worry that if the residential rental bylaw did allow some discretion of the building commissioner in the implementation of the program, where we could ask for such a variance or waiver is as long as that process is seen as in accordance with, I've got no problem with it. And that's why I just say, does it make sense to make it a little bit more clear? I'm not going to die on this hill because I think it's probably okay, but I'm just that the variance example is one that comes to mind. Sure. Yeah. The, the bylaw allows for, I think it's actually maybe in the rules and regs that's cited in the bylaw that there is a waiver provision anytime there's a renewal or a possible inspection or fee. So, you know, in year 17 or year 12, if this has been inspected once and it's had good standing and you say, well, you know, we have other reasons to, you know, it, it's inspected annually through Amherst College or the property manager and you have those reports and you could ask for a waiver from any piece of the bylaw. Um, but, uh, you know, again, that's the way, you know, the building commissioner would like to see that, you know, operate you know, I, you know, if you wanted to have another clause, uh, you know, to, to clarify that original condition without the, you know, what's out, you know, underlined here, I think that would be, would be fine as well. Sometimes you write these, you know, strongly in the affirmative. And so if we had a qualifying phrase or something that, that would be fine as well. Okay. So, uh, Nate, it sounds like you'd be all right with striking the underlined sections or at least the initial few lines and and having a conditional uh added to the the sort of original language right it's kind of like what we do with inclusionary units we say you know to the extent like allowed by law you know we'll follow local preference right so uh -huh. it's not like we're going to get we can't we can't require a local preference of affordable units beyond what the state regulates right so it's like we can't require this to register with rental permitting if it doesn't need to. And so, you know, if we want to have some, you know, introductory yeah, as, there as required by the, or if required by the Amherst, but by a residential property bylaw, re rental registration bylaw uh, in the town of Amherst, the property shall be registered, something like that. That's fine. All right. So, Pam, did you take adequate notes for our perhaps getting this revised? I did. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. So, we think we'll probably want to revise number 19. Uh, and, uh, Jesse, yeah, Jesse and, and Fred, I do see your hands. So Jesse, why don't you go ahead? Sure, just quickly, I, I was gonna say the same thing. I agree the original language leaves it up to the building commissioner essentially. And I don't I don't think we have the authority to waive that as a planning board. Yeah. yeah I would be in favor of returning to the original language with a provisional, con with that clarify if needed, but even without, I think that's what would happen. So okay. that's my thought. Great, and Fred? 
Yeah, I uh, I have a real problem with uh, these revisions because uh, I think it uh, positions the site plan review in opposition to the uh, Amherst Rental Registration Bylaw uh, implicitly in pro in uh, opposition to it. I, I there's a lot of things I don't go along with with the building inspector, but this one. I think I have to agree with the building inspector on this. Uh, I don't think this should change. I think uh, if they're going to occupy this as a, as apartments, then they're going to register them as apartments. Uh, I, I, I don't see any grounds to try and craft an exemption where an exemption doesn't exist except through a process that is available under the rental registration bylaw. But I think that's, if, if they want relief, that's where they've got to go for relief. I don't think we have any business attempting to grant it for them. Yeah, uh, I, I think, feel I very strongly about that. Well, I think where we're ending up, we're not granting the relief. Uh, we're simply saying they need to follow the bylaw as I guess, promulgated and uh, uh, practiced by the building commissioner. Okay, um, Tom, why don't we move on to 21A? Sure, and so we added an A because we added a B and instead of renumbering the entirety of the sequential conditions, that's one of the things we did. So you'll see 21B is a new condition. 21A is a revision to an existing condition. That existing condition, maybe this will be easier, says any substantial modifications to the lease agreement, which may impact tenant oversight as determined by the building commissioner, specifically including minor updates, such as pricing, date modifications, clerical errors, or language, updates required by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or other government entity shall require application to return to the planning board at a public meeting. So because of the nature of the tenancy here, um, we wanted to have a carve off because this condition contemplates uh, lease agreements with tenants. And that is not what's going to be happening here. And so that's why we say, while a nonprofit educational institution occupies the dwelling units, no lease agreements for the occupants of those dwelling units, uh, maybe that should say are required for those dwelling units. However, if any of the dwelling units are not occupied by a nonprofit educational institution, then it reverts back to kind of that original language. And then for those not occupied by a nonprofit, which may impact tenant oversight, et cetera, et cetera. So then that one, if I could just go to the next one, taken in conjunction with if the tenant is a nonprofit educational institution occupying the dwelling units, a notice of lease between the landowner and the tenant shall be provided to inspection services. So, so that gives the inspection services evidence that there is a lease between the landowner and the nonprofit educational institution. And then um, we would not have to provide any of those updated lease agreements because there wouldn't be those lease agreements. However, when the lease with the Amherst, the nonprofit educational institution terminates or is reduced or modified so that there are units, either some or all, which are not leased to that nonprofit educational institution, we do have to provide uh, that lease and the notices to the um, building commissioner for review. So again, just trying to encapsulate what's happening here and the realities of it while allowing Barry in the future to, to kind of have a seamless um, approach. Um, Nate, um, is it the rental registration bylaw that requires submission of the lease for each apartment? I, I, I'm not sure that it requires that necessarily. Um, so this is something that is actually instituted by the planning board. Yeah, I think when this originally came about, there was some worry um, about, you know, how this would be rented. And so we put in this condition, original condition that read, you know, 
basically, as Tom said, you know, it said any substantial modifications to the lease agreement, which may impact tenant oversight as determined by the building commissioner, specifically excluding minor updates, such as pricing, date modifications, clerical errors, or language updates required by the Commonwealth or other governmental entity shall require the applicant to return to the planning board at a public meeting. And so I think it was some roundabout way to try to get, you know, if a lease agreement changes, the planning board should hear it. Um, you know, to me, sometimes we don't actually get into, sometimes the planning board does, sometimes it doesn't, the ZBA does sometimes, you know, we want to see lease agreements to make sure say that they're not, you know, if, if we want a 12 year, a 12 month lease or a full year lease. But uh, I mean, to me, that I'm not sure what that condition was saying. It was really at the discretion or determination of the building commissioner if there was a substantial change to some lease agreement. And so, I mean, typically we don't zone for, you know, we don't have zoning that gets to the end user and, you know, the tenancy piece. And so, right. you know, I, I, you know, I mean, honestly, like these, the changes are fine. I think the original condition was kind of odd um, to begin with. Uh, so, you know, if this is the applicants requesting this for clarification, I, you know, I see no problem with it. Okay. Well, I, I mainly just wanted to know if this was something that was a part of the rental registration submission, which again, we wouldn't be able to waive. So, but you're saying no. So, okay, great. Um, Bruce. Uh, Tom, might I correctly understand or uh, interpret this to essentially mean that that the uh, once having leased the entirety or whatever portion of the entirety of the building uh, uh, that Amherst College might decide to lease, that they they then are able to manage what essentially would be the subleasing uh, without um, without without the uh, end of, without having to deal uh, sublet sublease by sublease with the town. Is this essentially something that the college is or any nonprofit would be looking for to be able to essentially manage the subletting of a building once they had leased it? Is that the way? Is that a reasonable way to characterize this? Yeah, and I'll, I, I'll put a final point on that. I don't know uh, that the college actually subleases, as that term may be defined from a legal perspective, any of these no. units. There's probably- I was just using it as a, the only word that I knew that would more or less describe what's happening, but whatever it, whatever a better word yeah, is. Yeah, and maybe I'll put it this way, Bruce, is that, that consider that residential portion as- uh, the space that is the least premises and the college has under their lease the ability to use it in accordance with the these approvals but to to use it how they see fit and so you know i'll, I'll be careful with the sublet but the I, the concept is correct right and and so that's okay. why it would it make sense for every time because there there just doesn't exist those documents which have like go to the building commission and say, well, he, here's what you want. And I think to Nate's point, it's somewhat, I, I'll use the word vestigial, but I would say even here, not applicable. If you'd want to strike 21A or, or 21 and intentionally omit it and not even have a 21B, that'd be fine also. We're just trying to work within the context of the conditions that you gave and being respectful to the, to the planning board for the work that you put in. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Tom, let's go to 25. Okay. Last but certainly not least, um, and this is um, simply because the, the condition read the owner shall have an on-site resident manager or 24-7 supervision in order to ensure the safety, health, and welfare of tenants. The owner may return to the planning board at a public meeting to request a revised condition with alternative arrangements to achieve this goal. And so here again, we just wanted to acknowledge the situation and say, um, the on-site resident manager or 24-7 supervision, which if it's occupied for this nonprofit educational institution, uh, the nonprofit educational institution shall manage the dwelling units consistent with its staffing and management for campus housing. And instead of tenants, we just called it occupants. So uh, again, I don't want to get too cutesy, but it, it seemed like for what we're looking to do, it was kind of the, the comprehensive approach to this while allowing, again, Barry in the future, if the nonprofit educational institution was not occupying the space he wouldn't have to come back. It would just be that uh, he would have to have on-site resident manager or 24-7 supervision or pursuant to that final sentence, 
be able to come back and say, hey, here's what I'm doing. Can we have this arrangement? So again, um, that's the request. So it does appear that this revision would eliminate the require, would, would no longer require an on-site resident manager. In other words, we would be deferring to however Amherst College wanted to supervise the project. And um, that could include not having a 24 seven, have not having supervision 24 seven. Do I interpret that correctly? I think it could, um, I think it could be read that way. We've got in the additional information for the management plan that Amherst College will have residential life staff in the building consistent with its staffing for campus housing. Right. Um, which which could easily be less than 24 seven. Correct, correct. And, and I uh, suppose one of the other comments I would make to you is that it doesn't, the condition as it's in its current iteration does not say, 24 seven with no alternatives, it provides an on-site resident manager, which um, may not have that 24 seven requirement there. So I don't see it as going from certain 24 seven supervision to something less than that. It's, it could be an on-site resident manager. It could be 24 seven supervision, or if it is a nonprofit educational institution, then it's how they uh, uh -huh. run their business, if you will. Okay. Uh, Jesse and then Fred. Thanks. Um, yeah, I was not told totally, totally, I was not really in favor of this condition to begin with, um, but I do agree that means Amherst College could decide no, there's no supervision and just is what it is. And then that would be fine. I just right. want to clarify that is what this could result in. If they right. change their management plan for their all their buildings, that could be what happens. Correct, Tom? Just so I understand. Yeah, yes. I think that's I think that's a fair read. It's not that was not my intent, but I think it's certainly reading the language the way that it's written. That is, yes, that could happen. And I frankly think we want to give the latitude to Amherst College. And I think, um, you know, these are conditions, but as a practical matter, if there's going, if there's an issue on the site, there's going to be, uh, I mean, you've got a slew of, I can't even count them because I don't have it off the top of my head, other conditions that somewhat regulate management. So I just. Yeah, I was going to follow up with, yeah, but. Yeah, so I have no problem with it. Yes, okay. my okay. yes, but you're correct. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jesse. Fred. Uh, yeah, I'm comfortable with 25 the way it's written. Uh, uh, I mean, basically, this is going to be a small dormitory, and uh, there doesn't seem to be uh, public policy issues with Amherst College dormitories that I'm aware of. Um, so I, uh, I, I think I'm comfortable with, with 25, the, the way it's written, I just, I could be persuaded otherwise, but right now I think I would support it as written. Okay. All right. Thanks, Fred. All right. So, uh, I, I believe that the, there was the one condition on the previous page was it 17 or 19? 19. 19, 19 where we were going to be basically just adding an, a, an introductory conditional phrase at the beginning of the original language, something to the effect of if required by the Amherst residential rental property bylaw, then we'd go on to the rest of the uh, Conditions. And, as and maybe what I would say is just to kind of touch on my variance argument, maybe as in a positive phrase, like if required uh, by the Amherst Residential Rental Property Bylaw, comma, comma, or waive there under, comma, and then get into the rest of it. Just to, again, okay. just to acknowledge that it's possible that it could be waived by some authority other than the planning board. Thank you very much. All right. Um, so with that edit, um, I have, have, have not heard of other 
edits it to this that are objectionable to the board? Have I, have I misremembered? Uh, would somebody correct me soon if I'm wrong? Um, and before we leave, uh, before we get to a vote, I am gonna ask for public comment. So maybe uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and do that before we come back for probably a vote. All right, so we still have uh, 12 attendees. And uh, at this time, I would like to invite public comment on the totality of the uh, revisions uh, of the applicant. So I see one hand from Ken Rosenthal. Pam, if you could bring over Ken. Hi, Ken, if you could give us your name and your street address, uh, you will have three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Ken Rosenthal, 53 Sunset Avenue. Uh, I've known Barry Roberts for almost 50 years. There is no better developer in Amherst than Barry. He works very well with the neighbors. He does what he says he's going to do, and he builds very well and is good for Amherst. And that's why this morning when I got a phone call early in the morning from two Amherst College retired professors who are considering selling their house and wanted to know where in Amherst they might live and have a better uh, uh, and, and live closer to the center of town with access to restaurants and other facilities. I recommended, of course, that they see Barry Roberts and consider this project. I gave them Barry's telephone number and email address. And then I found out there was a meeting tonight and this subject was on the meeting. This is a terrible, terrible idea. This change in Barry's plans means that this is a dormitory for 60 some students in Amherst in town center. Mr. Hartwell is the only man who's dared to use the word dormitory, but that's what it is. The project uses words like residential life staff and campus housing. Now I'm an Amherst alum and I have a high regard for Amherst administration. I knew they want to do a very good job of managing their own facilities, but what we want in town center are housing for year round residents, people who will register their cars in Amherst, people who will then pay the Amherst auto registration tax to excise tax to the town of Amherst, people who live here and shop here, who spend their money in town, who don't go home on weekends and summer times, who are here for the long run. This is one, one more nail in the coffin of Amherst as a residential community for people who live and work in town. Now, my friends, did not know about this change and neither did I. And of course, now they're going to look elsewhere. They're not going to be able to live here, even if they wanted to. Again, I have a high regard for Barry, but this is a terrible mistake. I hope you will, at the planning the board, you have to plan for the better of town, not just deal with question after question in isolation. This is a terrible change for the middle of town that should not be allowed. Barry's original plans, which would have 22 units with 63 beds, which would make it possible, yes, for some students to rent directly from Barry, but also make it possible for other people who are year round residents to do so. That would be a good idea. This is gonna be something that is run by Amherst College for Amherst College students and nothing other than Amherst College students. And I'm very sorry that this is change, change is being presented to you. Please vote it down. Thank you, Mr. Roberts, and thank you, Planning Board. Okay, thank you, Ken. Um, yeah, I guess I will say somewhat, in, I guess in response, Ken, um, first of all, this is a site plan review and it's difficult for us to absolutely reject such proposals. Um, secondly, I don't really view most of these changes as being necessary for uh, Mr. Roberts to uh, execute this transaction with Amherst College. Um, you know, I think uh, Tom made clear earlier that he was here on behalf of Amherst College and Barry in order to make perfectly clear to all of us what is going down uh, rather than have it happen uh, off, out of sight, let's say. Um, so uh, I guess I, I respect that urge and um, having brought it up, uh, Tom and Barry, you're gonna get a few slings and arrows uh, of this plan. But I, I don't think 
you know, this could have happened without any public hearing tonight. Um, there might be, you know, changing apartment to occupancy unit or tenant to resident. Um, you know, I, I'm sure there was a way you could have structured that deal so that you did 23 different individual leases for units with Amherst College um, and didn't have to do a single umbrella lease. Um, and that would have been perfectly consistent with the conditions we gave you. So Ken, I think I, I totally get where you're coming from. We do need pe more people living downtown, but I'm not sure what we could have done to prevent this. And, um, you know, that's, that's what I think. Uh, does anybody else want to comment uh, on what we heard from Ken or, you know, I'm not seeing any other hands from the public. Um, and I know, Karen, you had your hand up before we started public comment. So, um, okay. So uh, I guess Bruce will go to you and then Karen. And while we're listening to them, members of the public, if anybody else wants to speak, please raise your hand. I'll be quick. Uh, for the record, I agree with Ken. And uh, Doug, I agree with you. Um, I'm sad to see that uh, the vision that Ken seems to have actually tried to orchestrate by his references and so forth to Barry uh, didn't happen or may not happen, but I regret that sadly we don't have the power to be able to do things differently. And uh, Barry's got his investment capital, you know, at risk or what have you. And uh, so I know that uh these things happen and i agree with you doug and, and it may be uh, in the fullness of time things will head more in ken's direction uh we just don't know but uh i agree i don't think there's much we can do about it except say what i just said and say what you said and ken say what you said okay thanks bruce karen yeah, I was going to all along say how uh, I just found out tonight what was happening, that Amherst College was taking this whole thing over. And as much as we love having Amherst College in town, I think it's, it's, it's very sad that they're taking over one of the prime spots, both, the, both actually the store and the residential things that could be really a vital part for the town of Amherst. Amherst College has beautiful buildings. They're doing great job, but this is one of the prime locations in the middle of town where I, I actually also said, okay, this is where we can put life into the town. And now we're just having life of, of that very lovely elite university and its people taking over that center. So it, it makes me sad but all along, I, I thought, well, what can we do about this? There's nothing we can do because they are wonderful tenants. They'll take good care of it. But it's a sterile sort of Amherst College presence that we have right on the common there, which is very much needed. Um, but I'm sure Barry will figure out another place where he's going to do what we need to have done, hopefully. All right. Thanks, Karen. Jesse. Thanks. Um, slightly different perspective to share. So I agree with Ken, Ken's sentiment completely uh, that what we would love to have in our town. But I don't think this is sad. I don't fault this transaction anyway. I think from inception, we all knew this was going to be all students. Until there's a whole lot more housing available, that's what's going to happen in building after building. That's why we're working on the overlay. That's why we're trying to have other projects to bring in more options. So. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I really don't have a problem with this at all. For, for, I think it's a pretty good solution. Might be actually managed better than it would be if it were students from all around. So. Okay, Jesse, Bruce. Um, when I saw this and read through this, I understood what was going on, and I understood from the rear apartments the format, you know, the, the way in which they would be planned with uh, more or less similar sized bedrooms and so forth. It wasn't entirely surprising. I kind of assumed that the front part of the building, the five apartments in the front, would be 
for Amherst College staff or what have you, as, as I, someone had mentioned earlier, and I think Tom indicated that that may or may not be the case. Uh, Barry, I, I, uh, given the, the mood, which if Ken's uh, question is indicative of uh, others in town, and I think I know it is because I've heard uh, folks uh, speculate on the outcome of this building similarly uh, uh, weeks and months ago, so I understand why, uh, 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 Tom, you're you're coming to be very clear about this. But Barry, is it is it possible that uh, the front section, the old part of the building that uh, I spent years in when I had my office there, so I know it feels lovely in there. It's quite different from what you'll build out the back, I'm sure. I wondered whether uh, some of Ken's aspirations and perhaps the boards as well and others in town couldn't be uh satisfied or serviced by uh getting some permanent residence uh in the front part of the building that is more conducive to mixed uh, or, or shall we say a, a, a more um interesting residential experience and have those people with their uh, overlooks to the common as i did it's a very lovely place to live uh um, it seems it would be really nice if some of that building could be dedicated in the way that ken was uh, thinking um it's a, a plea i guess all right thanks bruce tom or barry uh, any any anything you want to say or shall we move on um i mean a couple of things. First of all, we appreciate all the comments, Mr. Rosenthal. We we respect you and obviously everything that you've said. You've had a long relationship with with Barry. Um, to Bruce, um, there is already a lease, and so that idea of renting that front piece separate just wouldn't come to fruition. That's that's part of the leased area with with Amherst College. I'll say, uh, Barry has other projects, uh, thirty seven North Pleasant Street, which hopefully comes in front of the planning board sooner rather than later for I think it's eight residential units, which is at the old Ben Murphy's space. I know Kuhn Riddle is working on those plans. I know he's got plans for 336 North Pleasant Street um, to kind of revitalize that end of downtown as well. Um, I think this uh, was a good opportunity and I I would just ask that the, the board looks at it from a positive light of Amherst College willing to invest in downtown and bringing students downtown, right? You look at, frankly, before Barry got involved with the bookstore, it was uh, Hastings, which was well-loved, but out of business in an empty space. And Amherst College came into that space and revitalized that space at, at no insignificant investment either. And so, you know, Ms. Winter, we might have these ideas of what, what we would love to see there, but then there's that practical reality of um, making sure that the mortgage, is, the mortgage is paid, the bid fees are paid, the insurance is paid, the taxes are paid, the taxes, which, you know, one of the things to mention here is there's going to be significant taxes which go to the town that the town can use for other things. There's going to be rental payments to Barry that Barry can use for other things. And so, you know, I, I know that we can bemoan and, and maybe regret that that this location specifically is, is going the way that it's going. I would look at it positively that Amherst College wants to make this investment in town, in downtown, to have its students right there. If anything, to me, that's a vote of confidence in what downtown could be instead of saying, okay, Amherst College, you just stay in your little enclave and, and you know, be the good college that we, we want you to be, but don't come into downtown because we want it to be something else. I mean, this is this whole people that are moving to town. You've got UMass on one end, you got Amherst, Amherst College really on the other end, and Amherst College kind of in that middle, like people that move here, that's what, that's the vibrancy that, that they want to see. And, you know, if anything, you know, the, frankly, the, the building next door to what Barry's doing is now on the market for a price that I don't think they ever would have got if Barry didn't do the redevelopment that he he did, right? It's listed for $3.2 million. And that in the downtown, well, wait a second, you know, the archipelago on the other end, they they pay real money for those buildings and they put a lot of students in those buildings. So I just hope that the board and, and Mr. Rosenthal with respect understands that there will be other sites, there will be other projects, and that this is going to be good for downtown because the colleges 
looking to reinvigorate it. So thank you. Um, thank you, Tom. Um, you know, one thing that had occurred to me is that when we have a project that is likely to be occupied by a bunch of UMass students, we can argue that, well, this saves them from taking over a bunch of private homes elsewhere in town. Uh, I'm not sure we can make that argument with this project. Um, you know, I don't know whether Amherst College, I, I don't think they send any of their students off campus, right? Um, so uh, it's unfortunate that we can't uh, at least have that benefit of this project. Now, maybe Amherst College is going to be renovating some dorms and they want to swing the students out of those dorms into this area, sort of on a rotating basis for the next decade or something. I don't know. I can imagine that could be what's going on. Um, so, you know, is there an indirect benefit to the town to have Amherst College renewing its core residential housing? Yes. Um, if this is just allowing Amherst College to expand its student enrollment and avoid building a dorm and just leasing one, that seems a little less beneficial. But uh, those are just a couple of thoughts. Um, Karen, I see your hand. Why don't you go ahead? And then I see that Ken Rosenthal raised his hand as well. So we'll let him uh, have another word after you. Yeah, I just want to quickly say I, I do agree, Tom, with what you said, and I'm I'm very grateful and happy that Amherst College is willing to invest. The trend that we uh, just see in downtown is that the grown-ups, the families, the people with children are the ones that are giving up and leaving as more and more students fill the downtown, and that's the trend that's very worrisome for us that I was in and I and I am as uh Ken Rosenthal I'm grateful that we have Barry as a developer and I'm I'm sure glad that he's on this project so I just want to clarify that all right thanks Karen uh, Pam could you bring Ken back over we'll give him oh yeah go ahead Ken um, Mr. Marshall, thank you again for the courtesy of letting me have another chance to talk. Uh, I, I do want to emphasize that my regard for Barry Roberts and for the management of Amherst College is very high. And it's not that that I'm concerned about. Amherst College does have students living in town in that Marsh House and Tyler House and Plimpton House and Porter House. These are old dorm these are old fraternity houses that are used uh, in town and, and uh, for students, and they're here. It's the additional students that are displacing possibility of year-round residents who would like to live here. And in fact, as I mentioned this morning, uh, with my call this morning, are looking for places to stay in town, don't want to leave town, and want to live here as adults, as retirement adults, and, and, and as others. And that's what we should be asking the planning board to think about, find ways to encourage that to happen. And so, sir, I say to you, uh, yes, I understand why you may feel that you have to approve these things because there are some minor changes that don't affect Barry's ultimate change. But to turn them down is to send a signal to my good friend Barry Roberts and other developers that this is not what the planning board wants to see for the town and to find other ways to use property in ways that make this town better. And, and again, Mr. Marshall, thank you for letting me have this second opportunity to speak to you and to the and to the board. I want to say one more thing, Mr. Marshall. You are the only person who chairs a, a committee that tells us in advance who the visitors are. And that's very, very helpful to us who might want to speak, but would defer speaking if we knew somebody else was speaking on the subject. So you are you are an efficient manager of this process, and I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Uh Thank you, Ken. Um, thanks for the kind words. Uh, I will. I, I do feel I need to clarify. The reason I said that we can't really turn down a site plan review is because statutorily we can't turn a, down a site plan review. It's not that we feel that you know. I didn't say that because I feel like we're so far down the road. 
this is so minor, whatever, something more idiosyncratic, but it's actually statutorily basically impossible. We can impose conditions, um, and I don't know what the limit of those conditions are, but um, that, that uh, is something not everyone understands about the process. If this were a special permit, we could turn it down. All right. Um, all right, so Bruce, I see your hand. Uh, are you thinking the same thing I'm thinking? All right, well then, uh, do you wanna try to articulate it or should I? You're still muted. I think uh, you should. So right. I am, sorry, I have, I did type up something. I can share my screen if we're looking at okay, Nate, findings that'd and be conditions. Great. It's always nice to look at something when you're I don't know how visible that is. Is that? That's highly visible. That's great. And so, you know, here's the fi a possible finding. I, I'm, you know, I don't know if there's any conditions other than changing the rental registration piece and then a motion. Um, yeah, and then we'll need to vote to, uh, right. to close the public. Oh yeah, you got that there too. Mm -hmm. All right, so. Um, So why don't I why don't I read the finding and then we can discuss whether we want to edit it and then we can vote on it and we'll do the same thing with the motion. Fred, I see your hand. Um, just a little edit, maybe. Um, Nate, should the uh, that sentence read or otherwise waived thereunder? Because the way that's written, it sounds like it, it can happen either way. And that's not true. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Fred. Um, okay. So findings. The board finds that this application meets the relevant criteria of section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw and that the changes up to the site plan, management plan, and to the permit conditions are consistent with the site plan review approval SPR 2024-05 for the mixed use development at 4555 South Pleasant Street. All right. Uh, anyone want to make a comment about that finding? Fred. Uh. I think I should have said not otherwise waived there under. Sorry about that. Not otherwise waived. Let's see. How many negatives can I keep in my head at once? <laughs> uh, if required by the rental registration bylaw. Or unless waived. there yeah, under. I don't think we the want a way. not. I don't think we want a not there. I think we just want. Unless waived, that are, yeah, that would work. that's fine. Good, Tom. I hope you'll raise your hand if you want to, if you have any issues with this wordsmithing. Yeah, I'm. I'm thinking through it and wondering if it's an an and or an or. Oh, you yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Nate, do you have the original language that we that follows this? Uh, I do. I just I don't have it in the. Uh, you don't have it in editable form. No. If you give me a minute, I can. Um, I'll stop my share. And... I think it'd be helpful to see it all together. Yeah. So that we can. You know, Jesse. Isn't isn't the if doing what we're trying to accomplish to take out that the middle clause if required by the rental bylaw because yeah. if it's not, it's not required. if not required then there's no i don't yeah. think you need that little I, phrase in the middle yeah i think you're that sounds like you're right <laughs> the, the yeah, phrase we, is a little bit important for us so if we could 
I mean, I just it it isn't because I think, and I, I'm not disagreeing with with you. I just think, based on experience, that sometimes if you don't say the next part, then you want it to be written out that there is a possibility it could be waived. Yes, correct. Uh -huh. We want to acknowledge that possibility. Correct. So it it, it if required. And unless waived, then uh -huh. so sure. right. So you take yeah, out the I and unless waived, right? So if that. required, here's what you're gonna yeah. do. And unless it's waived, because that's the way to get away from having it be yeah. okay. okay. Nate, did we give you enough time to cobble it together? Uh I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves, right? So if uh okay, great. If required by the rental registration bylaw and unless waived thereunder, the property shall the, uh, it should be the, the units, units at the, at the property. Yeah, the, the units or the units at the project. The units at the project shall be registered and permitted in accordance with the Amherst Residential Property Bylaw. Loss or suspension of a rental permit shall constitute a violation. All right, so that looks reasonable to me. Does anybody want to fiddle with it a little bit more? OK. All right, so <clears throat> all right, so then the motion on on approving the SPR will include the editing to these conditions. Is that right? That's part of the motion, not the or it's just a the motion actually for the conditions is that the revised conditions as drafted and presented at the meeting are acceptable with the exception of revised number 19, which needs to be edited as shown on screen here, period. All right. And then move to approve SPR 2025-5 South Pleasant Street LLC 4555 South Pleasant Street by approving the requested modifications to the previously granted site plan approval, yada, yada, including changes to the site plan, management plan, and conditions with the findings as discussed and to close the public hearing Shouldn't I say something like, and conditions as proposed and subsequently edited in the meeting? Revised. Mm -hmm. Subsequently revised? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, as, and revised in the meeting? At this, at the hearing. Yeah, that's good. Uh. So shouldn't the motion come before the conditions? We usually uh, make the motion and uh, to approve uh, with the conditions as follows. So it's I see it's all here, but the order doesn't uh, isn't isn't conventional to me to my way of thinking, because the uh, the 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 revised condition nineteen is is subordinate to the motion which uh, should precede it. You're just talking about reversing the order on the page. Uh, I mean, that's the, the way motion... it's going to come out with the decision. So I don't think it really matters, but it's, uh, it's we just have to recognize that the order of things laid out here yeah. is unconventional. Right. Yeah, I mean, okay. typically though, we'd want to keep the hearing open to review conditions in case we need any new information. So, you know, uh, you know, however they're presented in yeah. the decision, it's, you know, usually we keep the hearing open as we discuss conditions. Okay. All right. I'm good. Okay. So Nate, um, we have one motion 
and it seems to include the findings and the conditions, approval of the site plan review, and to close the public hearing. So we need one vote. And um, Bruce, I'll assume your hand is just a legacy hand. It's actually to second your motion. Oh, so okay. assume it to be that until I, unless okay. I change my uh, voice. <laughs> all right, all right. So, so I guess I'm making the motion as as written here on the page. Bruce has seconded. Is there any discussion by the board for this motion? Or is everybody all set to vote? I am not seeing any hands. All right. Well, Karen. I just want to just make one comment that this part of town is one part of town which would be really attractive for uh, people that are retired and people with children. The other part of town now has already so many students and bars and things like this. So it, it does make me sad to lose this area, but not enough to stop it. Okay, thank you, Karen. All right, uh, I guess I will call for a vote. Um, we'll go through the roll call. Lawrence is still uh, abstaining from this discussion. So Bruce, we'll start with you. I approve. Fred? I approve. Jesse? I approve. Um, Johanna? Aye. Karen? Aye. I am an aye as well. Six in favor. One member recusing himself, the motion passes. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Barry. Um, good luck with your project and we hope you develop some more housing that is more attractive to the general population. Thank, Thank you. you, more to come. Bruce? Um, Doug, uh, I respectfully uh, am, am going to uh, exit the meeting. I'm leaving the country tomorrow. And I mistakenly anticipated that this would be a short meeting and I've got a lot of things that I haven't done yet. So okay. I'll, uh, there was a, there was a P, there was a planning commission meeting, um, but I have nothing to report on it, uh, at least not okay. in this meeting. So I'll do that later. If you'll excuse me, um, I'll, I'll see you uh, in a month or so. Okay. We will miss you. Thank you. Where the um, hell, how do I let get the out record of show that Bruce left the meeting at 8.51. Um, board members, we have gone well past our usual break time. Um, I think we don't have very much left to do. Are you all fine with just continuing on and finishing up? rather than five, six, eight minutes later. Okay, all right, fine. Um, so as I said, the time was 8.51, it's now 8.52, we'll move on. We got through old business, new business, Form A, a and r subdivision, I believe. Um, Pam, upcoming ZBA applications, anything to give us a heads up on? Anything, uh, Nate, do you? Uh, no, we know Wayfinders is moving through their 40B permitting process. Uh, Shootsbury Road Solar will be coming back uh, in November, but likely uh, continue, you know, it'll be continued. It may actually be asked to be continued without testimony at that hearing. Um, and I don't really know of anything else. Um, yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Doesn't have to be anything. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, planning board and com committee and liaison reports. Uh, Jesse, is housing subcommittee continuing to meet? Yep, we met uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, and um, had a long discussion about the council discussion of the overlay and the article in the Gazette that was written about it. Um, 
we were all, I think, a little taken aback by the some of the responses. And we had debated, and I think I'm going to take a stab at writing a response to that response and maybe bring that to the board for opinions and maybe try and send it as a response in the Gazette, just as people, not necessarily the board. Um, and we continued talking about how to bring a definition of student home to the board and then to the council, hopefully. Uh, the discussion was mostly around whether we needed to bring such a definition with a purpose or if we thought it would ever fly without a purpose. And people thought mm -hmm. at various opinions on that. So we're still crafting that attempt. All right. May I ask if you are making progress on your minutes? Yes. So there was a set approved last time. There's a set that will be on the agenda for this coming one. Um, and yeah, we're, we're, we're okay. We, and, uh, meaning me, are getting better with Karen's help. Okay. And Nate, are these being posted? Yeah. So they're, as a subcommittee of the planning board, if you go to the town's, and I'll say YouTube channel, and you go to the planning board playlist, they're embedded within that. So, you know, uh, the three or four meetings of the housing subcommittee are all available online within the planning board playlist. So you mean the recordings of the meeting? Yes. Yeah. What about the minutes? Oh, the minutes. Yeah, I have to um, I, I, have, I have to figure out where to put them. I think I have to create either a new, uh, you know, um, oh, place yeah. in the, on the Internet or that would just go into the planning board. But, um, you know, yeah. Yeah, I, since I'm not a member, I I would actually look at the minutes, <laughs> right. so so that I have a clue of what's going on. Yeah, there'll be linked from the planning board webpage. We just have to set something up, you know, structurally on the on the um, you okay. know, on our content manager side, how to do that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Bruce gave his his uh, non-report for PVPC. Uh, I can tell you. Um, I've started seeing a couple of emails about CPAC, even though I'm not a member. <laughs> and that's uh, something we still need to vote on. And I see in the agenda that this was the moment where we were going to talk about that. Um, has anybody had a change of heart and is now willing to be a CPAC member? Don't all raise your hands at once. Nate, you, yeah, you, you know, um, the, the, the town manager asked if there would be a planning board representative. And so, you know, the CPA committee is a committee made up of uh, representatives from other boards and committees and then at large members. Um, and the planning board is one of a few statutorily named, you know, town boards or committees that would send a representative. And so, you know, we think it's really important to have it. We get it. It's extra meetings. Um, you know, Doug did it last year. I will say that there are there weren't an overwhelming number of proposals this year. Uh, I don't want to jinx it, but you know the uh, it may reduce the number of meetings and kind of complexity of discussion in terms of funding. So uh, you know this this year might be different. You know maybe different than last year, and what would be different than next year? So, uh, Lawrence, I see your hand. Yeah, I'll I'll do it if nobody else wants to do it. Well, that would be that would be great because if you weren't, you know, if you weren't, I was probably going to have to do it again. Um, I I can say that Nate Nate's correct. There are eleven applications this year. Um, most of, probably half of them are from the town. Um, and if you're willing to do that, I think we should hurry up and vote for you. Um, so, board members, any uh, discussion of, of nominating, recommending Lawrence as our liaison to the Community Preservation Act Committee? So, I was going to jump in. Lawrence, you can always ask Doug too. If, you know, you guys can talk offline about his experience and you can reach out to myself or staff with any questions. We could, you know, go over it. So, it's, they haven't really met yet this year. Yeah. Proposals were due at the end of September and they're just, they were just, yeah, as I just saw today. them today. Yeah. Yeah, so I can forward you those emails. Um, okay, so board members, I think we should have a quick vote on 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 Lawrence because uh, I think uh, Paul Bacham will probably want us to have voted. Um, so I'm making I'm making a motion to uh, appoint Larry uh, Lawrence as the uh, 
uh, liaison to the CPAC committee. Anybody want a second? Karen? Okay, thank you. Any more discussion? No? All right, um, we'll go through the remaining members who are here, um, starting with Fred. Yeah, I. All right, uh, Jesse. Aye. All right, uh, Johanna. Aye. Karen. Aye. And I'm an I as well. Lawrence. Aye. Thank you. And thank you for volunteering. Uh, I appreciate that. Okay, so Nate, if you can let um, the town manager know that we did did do that, and hopefully he can quickly, uh, you know, appoint Lawrence to that position. I think there's a letter involved, um, and let let the chair of the CPAC committee know and and have his uh, email address so that he can start being on the distribution. All right, moving on, uh, Karen, anything for design review board? No, we're meeting on the 22nd, I believe. Okay. Um, report of chair. Um, well, and time is nine o'clock. Um, I guess, um, uh, I guess I did want to say, I think it's next next meeting on October 30th, which is a little, an unusual date for us, but it's because we skipped a meeting at the beginning of the month. We will be talking about the University Drive overlay. Um, Jesse, I don't think you need to prepare a letter because probably Nate and I are going to have to write a letter of report back to town council about our hearing on that subject anyway. Um, but I do hope everyone thinks about what they want to say in the hearing. Um, I do, I, I suspect that there'll be some town council members that want to listen in to what we say. Um, I do urge you to go back and listen to the town council discussion. Uh, I think Pam sent us the link to that recording and the point at which that discussion started, I think, you know, an hour and 52 minutes into the meeting or something. Um, so um, please do do that. That would be great. Uh, Jesse, I saw you thought you maybe wanted to say something. Yeah, I think we were thinking about putting out some kind of response before that open hearing, just to get more thoughts out in the ether. But, I see. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. I see. And I'm well, not sure we get it together. I guess you're. I guess you're. You're going to run out of time. Right. Yeah. I don't and, think we're going to. And I'm not sure, kind of, with you know whether that would be a personal letter from. Yeah. Just, yeah. I. I wasn't. I don't think it was like maybe the board will say something. It was just like. Yeah. Some of the opinions yeah. led to the overlay out there. Yeah. yeah. Well, you could certainly write an op-ed and put it in the Gazette. Yeah, that's that's what we we're really thinking. But again, yeah. I'm not sure. We'll or you time. could, uh, you know, submit it to one of the blogs in town, or both of them. <laughs> um, there's plenty of places that would like to hear comments. Um, okay, so um, I guess the only other thing I wanted to sort of ask and say, you know. I appreciate the work that Nate and Pam are doing, net, particularly now that Chris has at least taken a, a short vacation before she comes back as a, some sort of part-time post-retirement employee. Um, I think they've got a lot on their hands and I appreciate them, their support. You know, I have a colleague at work who's on the Hadley planning board and they have no staff. So, and they actually have no staff that receives applications. The, the first part of their meetings, applicants show up with their forms and they have to process that. And, you know, so we've got it good, guys. Don't forget that. All right, that's really all I was gonna say. Um, uh, I do, I, I guess I read one other thing that I was going to say, which is the housing subcommittee, um, I at least feel a little bit left out. And, 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 I, and I, 
I, I know I don't really want to go to additional meetings, but I'm, I have wondered if whether our workload was light enough to, seg to set out time in our regular meetings for those discussions. Um, and, you know, tonight was, tonight certainly looked like it would be a pretty light meeting. We managed to fill it. Um, and that's often the case. But I guess I would like to ha just have people think about whether, you know, that, whether that might be worth trying for a while. Um, so, Jesse. I just quickly comment on that. I think that would be great. I mean, you know, again, the reason we formed the subcommittee was it didn't seem like these topics could get to the full board with, regular, yeah. with regularity. Um, how, long, how long have your meetings been? Only, only an hour. Um, only an hour. So if we manage. Because of time constraints by all yeah. of us, right? Um, but again, if, if minutes, you know, would help, of course, we'll get more on that. <laughs> so, well, uh, you know, that, but that way, you know, if we combine them, then there's just yeah, one set that's, of minutes. That's fantastic. And, and it's and less you guys work don't have to, to do that. And, and it's just part of the regular business. Absolutely. We're so, We'd all welcome that. Okay. Um, so, so Nate, maybe as we look ahead, uh, on our agenda, um, we should think about whether we can carve out some time for that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, if we want to segue to report to staff, I think that would be good. The, um, I was going to say that, you know, November or October 30th is the public hearing for the proposed, you know, university drive overlay. There will be a November 6th meeting of the planning board and then, you know, subsequent meetings. Uh, so, um, you know, there's a few other projects coming up possibly. And then there's the ADU bylaw, right? So the state changed, you know, accessory dwelling units and we need to change our bylaw. It's something that the planning board should start looking at. We should, you know, we could make one or two simple changes um, or we could make a few additional changes. It should be ready by February um, 25. So uh, something staff will work on and probably bring you the planning board in November that, you know, there's some changes to that bylaw. So. Um, the state hasn't really come out with some of the nitty gritty details, uh, technical aspects. I think we're just gonna have to have in our bylaw and then, you know, see what happens. Um, you know, for instance, we allow ADUs bigger than what the state defines. So the recommendation is that could be considered a local ADU. And then there's an ADU by state definition. And so a property that already has a quote local ADU is then also allowed by right to add a state ADU. Uh, and, you know, we can't have an owner occupancy requirement or, you know, some regulations related to parking or over overly, you know, overly regulate that ADU in terms of dimensional standards or standards and conditions. So, um, you know, you can have more than one ADU on a property. So th there's things that, you know, I think the planning board can discuss with that. Um, you know, and then, you know, talking about East Amherst or other areas to rezone, I think, you know, the, I think even when this, uh, you know, 4555 South Pleasant was being discussed, you know, the payment in lieu was discussed and, uh, you know, what would happen there and how the trust could use it and whether or not we wanted the affordable units. You know, I think it's a really important discussion to have, you know, where do we want students? You know, I think students bring a lot to where they are, right? They can bring disposable income, they have guests, they have family, they, you know, will shop and dine downtown or wherever they live. And so, you know, I think part of the discussion the housing subcommittee has been having, you know, is okay if we can zone or allow student housing somewhere, or whether it's more just, you know, multi unit development, are there other regulations or policies that could help uh, guide development in other parts of town? And so, you know, the comprehensive housing market study mentioned having, you know, kind of this multi pronged approach. And I think it's something we're ready to have. So that can be discussed. We started it, you know, um, last year. In terms of other things, I, I'd want to say, you know, the housing production plan is underway. There's a survey I think that's going to go live soon in terms of um, asking about housing need and demand. The downtown design standards is still moving forward. There's a visual preference survey that's available online for anyone to take. There'll be, uh, uh, I think on November 21st or somewhere around there, there will be a pretty big uh, workshop about the streetscape. And so Dodson and Flinker will be presenting more information about what they see in terms of uh, streetscape design and recommendations. And so, you know, um, there's a web page for that. Uh, I know there's other things happening, but those, you know, those two are big ones. Um, well, Nate, um, you know, you've, you've mentioned a number of things that are sort of 
I'll call it regulatory or sort of overarching process uh, that are coming. Um, is there a lot in terms of specific project applicant applicants that you're aware of? I know we, earlier we talked about you know upcoming this that and the other thing, and it didn't seem like there was very much. But does it seem like it's going to be a busy season for us from an applicant point of view? You know, there's the high school track and field as a site plan review. You know, they're they're going to put a new track and field in, uh, so that's coming forward. Uh, there's another preliminary subdivision plan for 422 Amity Street to possibly freeze the zoning there, depending on what happens with the overlay. Um, I think there's one other site plan review application. I mean, I don't, I don't see those as you know being too extensive. Uh, so, okay, all right, well. So maybe there'll be some opportunity to have some, some yeah. housing discussion um, during. Yeah, you know, not, yeah, and I think for some of those hearings. So in November, if we wanted to, you know, even say the high school track and field is a hearing. I mean, I would be okay with saying, you know, we're only going to talk about it for an hour and a half one night, just to give ourselves time to talk about something else, and we can just right. continue it to a date certain. And I'm, I'm, you know, as opposed to having that take up the the full meeting, we could, you know, really. Um, we don't time items, but we could have that kind of decision. Uh, and I, you know, yeah, I think that's worth trying. Yeah. You know, maybe we can wrap some things up sooner if we don't have open ended. You know. Okay, uh, so that includes that was your staff re staff report. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, Pam. If you have anything else, I'm trying to think of anything, but. <laughs> no, I think you did a really good job of just cap capturing everything we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, we All miss right. Chris, can say that. She's mm -hmm. unfortunately come back to town hall to say hi. <laughs> she, she <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, well, uh, unless anybody has anything else they wanna say, the time is 9.10 and I think we can adjourn. It sounds like we won't have, uh, Bruce back for at least three weeks. So he'll probably miss the meeting on the 30th and maybe the meeting on the 6th, it sounds like. Yeah, he, he had mentioned at one point, I thought that given the time difference, he might be able to attend. Yeah, well, we'll we can keep our fingers crossed, but I'm yeah. not gonna, I'm not sure I would come to our meeting if I was headed to Australia. But I think it's more unusual for me than for him. Okay, so time is 9-11 and good night, everyone. Thank you for your time and your service. Doug, you too. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night, everybody. It's my recording. Good night. There we go. Good night, Pam. Good night, Mr. Marshall. Thank you for everything. <laughs>